Simon Riera. I'm here uh, to facilitate this discussion and as a representative of the New Zealand Cinematographer Society, uh, the chairman of that which I am. Um, I distinctly remember the first time I worked with Al Bol. Um, I was, uh, it was early on in my uh, camera assisting career and uh, I had a phone call, uh, I think it was a Tuesday if I remember, uh, from a producer, it was a Tuesday actually, I do remember, uh, from a producer saying that they needed a camera assistant for a day on a documentary and would I be interested. I said yes and asked who the DOP was and they said Al Bol. Uh, and to say I was mildly nervous is putting it. <laughs> I was at that the tender age. I was, and um, but it was with a feeling of awe and excitement. I have to say, it was there when I when I had the opportunity to work with him the first time. And here we are, twenty something years later. As I said, the chairman of the Society of Cinematographers, and I still feel the same way. Nothing's really changed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's with great pleasure that um, I introduce Al Bol to you today. Bef one small thing before we go, though, as part of the Cinematographer Society, we have just initiated a, uh, an accreditation system. This is uh, based on what other societies around the world are doing. Uh, you may have seen on the credits, uh, the American Society of Cinematographers have the name of the cinematographer plus AC a ASC after their name. And basically, it's a peer recognition uh, system instituted by the societies in order to... Uh, uh, to uh, appreciate uh, the, uh, the top in their field in the, the particular country. And we've just started an accreditation process at the NZCS and given out the first six accreditations uh, to members, uh, one of which is Albol. And uh, I'd like to present Albol today <laughs> with his accreditation certificate. And this is the first time they've been seen in public, so it's beautiful. Thank you. Further ado, I'd be like Clint Eastwood talking to the chair now. Yeah. <laughs> Without further ado, uh, let me introduce Al Wall. Hey, thanks, Simon. Thanks. Yeah, this is. Um, I suspect I'm never going to get the American Society of Cinematographers after the name, so this will do me. <laughs> I, I was always kind of hopeful we might call it the Aotearoa Society of Cinematographers, so we could make another convolution of the ASC. Because the, <laughs> the the Australian one is something ACS, 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 you know, and we could have been CSA or something. <laughs> you know. Anyway, there it is. Thank you. Cool. Um, now I, I'm going to kick off, try, try and follow the theme of this symposium, which I seem to remember as New Way Forward. So I, I'll try and talk about where we're going as, you know, in the, from my point of view, from the cinematographer's point of view, in relation to film, or storytelling, really, which means, you know, everything we do is, is storytelling one way or another. Um, but I'd like, also, I'm going to encourage you to participate. Um, apparently the bureaucratic word of the moment is, you know, a conversation, so we can have a conversation while we're, <laughs> while we're here. But... I, I, I just say that right at the outset to encourage you to participate because I'll run out of steam quite, you know, easily. And um, and if, if so, anything that comes up in conversation, like anything that if if you want to explore it further or take a different tack, then please interject or you know put up a hand or whatever's the right way to go about it. Um, because the, the thing that strikes me about the, you know, there have been a lot of changes actually in the time, technological mostly, in the time that I've been working behind a camera. And it's, uh, I had to think about it in bed last night, it's actually closer to 50 years now than it is to 40 years. So, um, so I've been doing it for a while and of course when I started, uh, it, we were shooting film, video cameras, one of which is at the back of the room were monstrous things that lived in studio, television studios. And I mean, they were literally monstrous machines and they had to be attached to cables to control rooms. So anything out in the field was shot on film. 
So I started, you know, when I started, we were shooting 16mm film, black and white actually, because television was still black and white then. Um, and of course, so I've seen a lot of changes in terms of the technology as the years have gone by. Um, even things like when I started, we had a cable between the camera and the tape recorder, which was recording sound, because we, we needed a pilot tone so that the two machines could be kept in sync for editing purposes. And then somebody invented crystal crystals which they put into cameras, which meant both the tape recorder and the camera would hold speed. So you got rid of that cable between the, between the sound man and the cameraman. And then some bastard invented the video split and back came the cables. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, and of course now it's changed drastically with with the digital age, and we are in it. You know, I've had to come to terms with it. Over the last two feature films I've done over the last couple of years have both been digital. One, the first uh, Lovebirds, it was kind of sprung on me. I took the project on thinking we were shooting film, but the producers had done the sums, and they always somehow the digital always. Even, you know, even in the big format for the big screen, they figure that digital is a cheaper way to go these days. And um, so I've just done another film, Medicine Woman, using the digital camera, and I have to say I'm feeling much more comfortable about it now. Um, and, and I've had to accept that that's what we're doing. We're shooting digital these days. I think we can... Quietly kiss film goodbye, except as a hobby medium, really. You know, we know how fast it happened. <laughs> you don't want to kiss it goodbye. No, I just wanted to ask, um, since it's, it's yeah. a conversation, um, when you say you, you've had to come to terms with it, yeah. I wondered if you could talk about your reluctance that that's what it is, well, in I, terms of the qualities of film. Yeah, yeah, I mean... <laughs> Some of you all know the technology. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I, the, there were limited choices when I did Lovebirds. Um, and I put the two obvious choices seemed to be the Genesis, which was a Panavision camera, and the Red, which is readily available. <laughs> and I put those two cameras side by side and sent the Red, ho red home yeah. almost immediately <laughs> um, because it couldn't deal with the contrast. Lovebirds is full of sh the locations are all sh chosen for the view out the window so I had to light the interiors well we had to light the interiors to a, to a level that meant you could see the interior and the exterior on all our locations and the red when I put the two cameras side by side I literally needed twice as much light to get the same contrast so I think really uh, you know, I'd sh I've shot digital shooting documentaries for a long time, and it's kind of a different game. It's much more hands-on. The smaller the camera, you know, something like that's great for documentary work. And you know you're going onto a small screen generally, and even if you're going onto a big screen, if it's documentary, story counts first, you know. Oh, it's, it's, uh, I, I sometimes get pulled up on saying that, but I really do believe it that... Story is first and foremost. I mean, I, my craft is to try and enhance that story through images, but it's still secondary. You know, the story is the thing. So I, I sort of feel like regardless of the technology you're working on, you, if you're telling a good story, you'll get away with it, even if you, you know, we used to sometimes shoot on 8mm or... Mm -hmm. Heck, we used to often shoot on borrowed 16 mil stock because it was out of date, you know, and you just make the best of what you've got. So I should, you know. So, yeah, I think, I think part of the, my nervousness in, in coming to digital was really, I feel like, pure inexperience. You know. I was nervous about it. I'm feeling much more confident about it now, having done two of them. But it is, it's where we are, and it's, and it's not where we're going, it's where we are. And I know that it will... The, the worst thing about it is that I thought, oh, this could be a good thing, that we're, we're not creating all these... You know, a film, a, a cinema film, comes in 
several cans and has to be shipped around the world or around the country. You know, now it's digital. I imagine it can be sent down the phone lines. It might not have quite got to there yet, but... So I thought, well, this has got to be a good thing for the planet. But they keep coming out with a new one of these every five minutes, you know. We can, I, I, mean, I have literally been in a, in a production house in Auckland where there was a Betacam video camera used as a doorstop. And the, camera was, <laughs> the camera was in perfectly good condition, but it's outmoded, you know. And I, I think that's, in a way, our next battle is to get the manufacturers to stop changing the specs every five minutes, you know. Let's just settle down and so we can get on with our job rather than chasing the technology all the time. But that's one little gripe I have with... But uh, I guess what will happen is we'll, we'll find the one, the tool that suits the job. And, you know, once, once upon a time... That's the other thing I've had to come to terms with is shooting on film, you choose a camera and then you choose the film stock for the scene. So you, we might be changing film stocks from one scene to another as the day goes on. Now, particularly, say, the ASA rating of a film stock, if I'm shooting a nighttime wide exterior of the streets, I'll be looking for a high-speed film stock, but if I'm shooting daylight sunlight, I'll be looking for a low-speed film stock. Now I have to f choose my ASA when I choose the camera, which is kind of weird, and that, that's something that's hard to get my head around. Naturally, if you've got nighttime scenes in the movie, then I'm going to choose a camera that has a high ASA rating. And when I shoot the daylight exteriors, I've got to put all this filtration in front of it to knock, knock the ASA rating back. As Simon was saying earlier, we, you can, of course, make adjustments on the camera to tell it to be a different ASA, but I don't do that because it's actually not... Nothing's happening. You're just pretending. It's something to be weary of, you know, the, the camera will tell, you can, you can change, this is an 800 ASA camera, but you can program it to be 200 ASA, but actually nothing's changing except the image that you're looking at, it's still recording an overexposed picture the way I figure it, you know, and I'd rather not do that, I, um, I'd rather know that I'm using the tool to do what it's designed to do, and I make the adjustments either on the set or in the grade at a later stage. You know. I've always been a one light work print sort of person. I don't want to I don't want to mess with the image until post production because I want to be looking at when I'm looking at my rushes or even looking at the monitor on the day, I want to be looking at what's actually going down into the into the talk. Anyway, that's enough technical talk on on uh, what else is changing. But just can I ask this sorry, mm, can yeah, yeah. conversation? The grade, do you think, though, that with the, with the shift to digital, that, that the grade is going to become a much bigger part of what we do? We, now that we can go back to the raw images if we want to in the grade of our do you think it's going to yeah, be a bigger part of the, the con process? The conclusion I've come to in terms of, you know, there's a lot of talk about quality. People talk numbers with digital, you know, 2K, 4K, 8K. And I try and stay out of that. Uh, <laughs> Because I think you can be misled very easily. You know, um, well, the red's a classic example. One of its selling points is that it's 4K, but it doesn't work properly. So why would I want to work? You know, a camera that doesn't that doesn't do what it's told. I don't want to work with. You know, um, what I've come to the conclusion just recently is actually that the best digital camera is the one that gives you the most latitude in post production. Yes. Exactly. So. So, I mean, the last sh shoot I did was on the Alexa, the Aeroflex, and that seems to be... I, I could treat it pretty much how, how I would w with film. Because one of the... Uh, I mean, if you haven't worked much with film, one of the things that they really were getting to with film before it met its demise <laughs> is the latitude, the exposure latitude. That You know, you could, you could have an image with... I remember printing down an image where I thought... That on, on came a hot Friday where I thought I'd completely blown out the windows which had lace curtains on them I thought well they're gone, seven stops overexposed in post production we pulled the shot down a bit and blow me down there with the lace curtains on these blown out windows now that, that sort of latitude we were really the bottom end of film in terms of underexposure was always was 
you had less latitude because you wanted to hit black, you know, you want to hit good solid blacks, but the range of exposure latitude on, and video is starting to get there. And from my observations, the Alexa seems to have that range. The Genesis had a kind of a cheated top end compression, which gave the alert, meant you could see out into the highlights out the windows. But what I discovered was when I tried to pull that down in post production, it was all washed out and pastely. It didn't actually, whereas if it was on film, it would have come in solid. But it, it's, it's so close to it. And I, in a way, convoluted answer to your question, but I, I, I've, I've decided that if I've got an image that I can work with, you know, that I have a lot of room to work with in post production, then that's the tool I want to work with. So, in a way, I mean, it's worth talking about the post production thing because it is a major part of the way forward. Is the whole what we can do in, in, in post production is so flexible these days, right down to, you know, oh, classic example on, I could show you the sequence actually, and if you're banging the little sequence of Matariki. Because um, you won't see it because we fixed the problem, <laughs> but I can point out how a little problem that we fixed on a sequence in Matariki, which wasn't shot on digital, it was shot on 16 mil. And I'm not sure how many years ago that was now. Four, five, four. Yeah. But um, I, I honestly don't think there was an another medium. I don't think there was. I think 16 mil was the only way we could have really achieved that shoot. It was a short, sharp shoot. There was quite a lot of hand holding, and 16 mil is just. Was such a it's such a versatile tool to work with. Um, nowadays, there are probably digital cameras that would do the job, but back then, I don't think we could have achieved the quality. With them. Is it cute so far? Yeah, it's all good. Cool. Just play. That, just then, then, then you don't have to listen to me talk all the time. Yeah. Hmm? Oh yeah, I think she's got control of that. It's all. <laughs> <laughs> Is it only a short segment so I have a look at? Shall I tell you when to stop? Yeah, tell me. Oh, sound. Oh, sound. <laughs> Probably good. Oh, I don't know where this is. Don't go back too far. So. No noises? It's not on my computer, is it? That might have been what it was. No, that's all right. Just it, it's a little bit further on. Hang on. It's just the weirdest thing. Just just happened. That's all right. Let it play. It's not. There's not. This is a fairly short scene. Cool. I imagine many of you have seen this film. I hope you yeah, have. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> For fuck's sake. That's right. Seen that film? Yeah. Yeah. It didn't do. It didn't do a lot of business, unfortunately. It's, it uh, sort of puzzles me because I. It's, it was always one I, I liked right from the script stages. Um, 
Yeah, the reason I pulled that sequence out was partly because it's, um, it's the classic handheld camera running through containers. Um, and uh, I, was, I was actually going to... I, I tried to pull out a sequence but couldn't find... Anyway, I didn't. Um, from City of God, which is a Brazilian film. And it, what struck me was watching that film, Brazil, uh, City of God, is there's a lot of agitated camera. You know, that sort of a lot of edgy coverage in the film, and I thought, and it's really appropriately used in City of God, and I see it so mis inappropriately used so often. You know, like Simon and I were talking, you know, two people sitting talking, and the camera won't <laughs> behave itself. You know, and I think, what what is it? You know, you can't just grab a style because it works in one situation and try and apply it to another. And so I, I had another look at City of God and realised that actually there's times when the camera's really under control, which of course makes you much more, makes the out of control sequences have much more bite to them. That, that scene, the reason I brought it up just when we were talking about that was because we had to, it was a little thing we had to fix in post-production using the computer technology. And it was literally, we were in the, so the film's been shot, been edited, and we're in the grade, and I saw the focus puller in shot. She was on top of one of the containers, because I, I, I was running around with the 16mm camera with a backpack on, with a little um, clamshell, you know, a little video split recorder on my back. So, and literally just running with a wide angle lens through the containers with the actors. And then when we'd done a take, I'd just stop and the director could have a look at what was going on. <laughs> and if we wanted another take, I'd do another take, because, I mean, I had no way of controlling... Well, you sort of do, you know what you do. Anyway, one of those shots, there was the focus puller, we're using a remote focus control, was sitting up on the containers, because she could watch what was going on down there, you know. And blow me down, there she was in shot, you know. And nobody had spotted it up until that point. And of course, she was an easy paint out because it's a black sky behind. So they just, you know, one line rotoscope the top, even though it would have been a moving line, it's just a one line at the top of the container to get rid of her head poking over the top. <laughs> but the other thing about that sequence was, and I still don't know whether it was Grant, my, my gaffer or myself, I think we kind of both came up with the idea at the same time. It's a huge environment to light because not, there's not only that running through the containers, there's a whole lot of driving stuff, which meant we had a big area to light. And it's a low budget, 16 mil Kiwi feature. So, and I, as I say, I don't know who came up with the idea first, but we got in, you see them in higher pool yards. They, they're a trailer with light stalks on them that they use on building sites. So we just got, a, I think we got four, maybe half a dozen of those in, and basically parked the trailers in convenient places, hid them behind a container, so all you see is the stalks sticking out the top. And they come with their own generator, so we could put them wherever we wanted and there's no cabling. And, but I, I always like that sort of um, low-tech initiative, I suppose, is <laughs> it? You know, it, and of course they can appear in shot because they look like they belong in a container yard. They're just floodlights on it. So yeah, there were, those were the. That's that was um, yes. How, how did you find colour coming out of them? Uh, it's I can't remember what they were actually, with the mercury vapour and, but I've had to. You sort of deal with that. I did have one big light up, oh, actually I think we had one cherry picker so that I could put a wash where I ha had control over the sort of whole area and so they were sort of more uh, and I mean look at the colours of those containers and that, it kind of didn't matter. You know? <laughs> I actually had a, a, uh, a situation on, on Heavenly Creatures which I was really proud of my gaffer on that one, it was TK Bedford we, the whole plasticine people world, which is, is a whole world that the art department built essentially out of polystyrene, their village, that the girls go into with the plasticine people. And 
it must have been, it was early in the year, but it must have been coming on April, May, May. Anyway, we're in Christchurch, the weather was packing it in, and the art department decided it wasn't going to be safe to build this set outside, which is where it was planned to be built. And that they wanted to move it into the warehouse that we had a production set up in. And me and my lighting team said, but we don't have the resources to light. You know, it's quite a big set, probably you know, a couple of, in terms of an area, it was a couple of, perhaps twice as big as this room, but quite tall, and we needed to light it for daylight. And the way I would normally do that would be put a, maybe put a, drape a big silk over the set and then hit it with top light so that you give the illusion of, space lights we call, give the illusion of daylight washing down into the set. But we literally didn't have the lighting resources to light this scene. And the gaffer said, well, this warehouse is full of lights. They were mercury vapour lights, which are a really weird colour. And we thought, well, yeah, there's, you know, there's a lot of power here, you know, but it's scattered all over the workshop. So me and TK came in on the weekend, pulled down one of these lights and did some tests. We looked at the colour and we looked for flicker because they're a pulsing light. And we came to the conclusion that actually since the characters were mostly plasticine people, we weren't worried about the slight strange colour hue. Uh, and made a point of when our two girls came into the set, I always had them kind of spotlit, which worked stylistically because it pulled them out of the crowd, but also meant I could keep their skin tones correct and let the plasticine people go a little bit green, and it didn't matter. So we lit that set. The only thing I had to get in was a big um, scrim to go over the set. And the, the lighting crew just pulled all the, all the lights out of the, all the mercury vapour lights out of the warehouse and hung them over the set. So that, those were our space lights for that particular set. And so it, then it, all it cost the production was the hire of a, of a scrim. So yeah, I, I, once again, you know, low tech solutions to <laughs> high tech problems. So. And a whole lot of genius, if I may say so. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's just having the spark of the idea half the time, right? You know, it's so, and so often that's what we rely on, I think, in, in, in you know, the creative processes. And it, it, Simon and I were talking earlier on too. You know, you never know where it's going to come from. I know that. Um, I think. I think most Kiwi DOPs would be encouraging of input from the crew. I've heard stories of DOPs who want their crew to just shut up and do their job, but I find you're working with a bunch of people in a creative process. You're a mug if you don't feed off it, you know. It's because um, often it's the group who comes up with the, the, the best way to achieve. A, you know, you, you might have, you and the director might have a fancy idea for a shot, you know. Oh, we can only do it with Steadicam. Well, I don't do Steadicam, and the group says, well, actually, we could do this, you know. It's, it's just, yeah, and, you know, mug if you don't draw on that pool of talent, if you like, that, that, that it is what a film crew is, the way I see it. Mm. Um, something else. What else do we Oh, just, just thinking about, in, in relation to New Way Forward, um, I think there are things that are changing. I mean, we know that it's changing. The, the style of storytelling that we can get away with is changing. And I think it's largely because of audience adaptability. You, know, you can throw stuff at an audience now. Like, probably even when I started in the business, late 60s, you know, the pacing of films was different. The, the audience expectations and of course they've changed as the and I, I, I mean you guys I have as many ideas as or more than amongst us as what's made for that change but I guess it's really the the sort of growth of the of media overall it means that audiences are incredibly dexterous I think is the best word for it they you know they can take on an idea really quickly um, well, it's another example Simon was giving earlier on was um, talking to his, how old's your child? 13. 13 year old, right, yeah. 
and saying, oh, did you see how they did that? And then the kid goes, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, they see shit, you know. <laughs> we think we're being really clever. They can see through our tricks, you know. <laughs> and and I, I, um, I, th I think that's, in, in a way, it's given us a whole lot of freedom to try stuff. You, know? you can be, you know, I think the audience is allowing us to be more experimental. In fact, it's almost obliging us to be more experimental. Yeah. So some of the old formulas still work, of course. I was just, I, I, I was just um, thinking to myself, in your experience from you know, in all the data you've worked with, have you found that like the modern sensibilities with cinematography and the different styles of coverage that you need now, it, um, has that started to uh, conflict more in terms of scheduling, in terms of um, how much you have to try and get done a day? Well, uh, it's, I think the simplest example is talking to a director about a, a possible upcoming project recently. Um, uh, talking to the director recently, the project's still upcoming. Um, and I said, so do you like to shoot with two cameras? And he said, well, you kind of have to, to get the cutting pace. The, you know, depending on your schedule, of course. You know, but if you're on a reasonably tight schedule... Um, I, I mean, I, I don't think it necessarily applies, but I could see what he was getting at, that if, if, if you want a quicker cutting pace, which, depending on the style of the project, but is often kind of expected from the audience. They don't want to be sit, sit you know, watching a wide shot for two minutes. Um, I, I kind of, I'm a bit in conflict about that one, because I actually feel that Pacing is one of the tools. Yeah, it is one of the tools. It's, obviously, it's one of the tools, and um, it always—it's always struck me how, you know, if you if you start giving the audiences high expectations with lots of crashes and bangs, then you've got to keep at that pitch. Whereas if you can, if you have a story where you can work gently into it, you can do much more subtle things to create surprise or shock or. System of like with with old cinema with with wide masters they were you know more elegant but also more more simplistic while there's more more demand now for, for laying down tracks doing dolly shots and, and yeah, yeah. Shots or shaky cam you yes. know but <laughs> but I mean I, I honestly do I think a lot of a lot of people resort to shaky cam because they haven't got a better idea you know yeah they can well, tell the story yeah. yeah well maybe it's just that they can't afford a dolly I don't know. <laughs> But I mean, I you know I do a lot of hand holding, and I think one of the tricks to hand holding is to not give away that you're hand holding unless you need an energy in the shot. You know, um, funny little I, don't, I haven't pulled out the example, but I, I remember watching a particular shot in a Roger Don Donaldson film, which was I think it was about earthquakes or floods, or I didn't watch the whole movie, so... Anyway, <laughs> there's a family, there's a calm scene with a family standing on a sort of a lookout. I think it must have been an earthquake film, actually. Some of you will probably know what it was. Well, Dante's Peak. Dante's Peak, it probably was that, yeah. yeah. As I say, I, I was looking at it just at a specific scene for some reason. But... Um, there's this, there's this shot of a family and, and, and it's all very peaceful and they're looking over the valley. And then there's an earthquake and, and they run. But what I was aware of in the shot where everything's calm was that the camera wasn't still. It was doing about what I'm doing now. And of course, as soon as the earthquake came, they ran and so did the camera. So that, the camera was on a steady cam for the second part of the shot but for the first part of the shot it should have been on a tripod or, it, it, or, or perhaps in this day and age they could have stabilised it in post production but I, I mean maybe the audience didn't but I'm in an earthquake film and if I see the camera doing this then it's in a way sorry but you've preempted what's going to happen <laughs> I shouldn't, be, shouldn't have been allowed to notice that you know it was, a, it was such a it was, a, it was a very subtle thing, but I suppose, you know, I'm used to looking at pictures and I, I was immediately aware of it. I thought, oh yeah, what's coming up? You know, <laughs> giveaway. Subtlety is part of it, you know. The, 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 and I believe makes a difference. 
Yeah, 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 in, in the edit indeed, yes. But, uh, yes, the, um, I, uh, I should say, you know, in relation to my job, the job of a cinematographer as a storyteller, that what I realise, I think my main mission, in a way, is to put the audience into the character's space. I mean, ideally, right into their headspace. And I often, I guess I, I, I largely work in cinema. Of course, I've shot a lot of television over the years. But, um, you know, a lot of television, particularly sitcoms, <coughs> the, the performers have to... Well, a lot of sitcoms are shot with fixed cameras in, a, in what's virtually a stage setting. So you, you're the audience and we're the sitcom, you know, and the cameras are positioned. And that, that, to me, it so often feels detached from the characters. You know that it's more like watching a stage play, if you like. And I do think, and of course you can do it with television as well, but I do think, in, my, in a way, my main task is to put is to put the audience into the experience with the characters. And I've never really worked out how you do it. It's just when it feels right, you know. It's, uh, I'm sure it could be analysed, but I've never tried to analyse it. I just, you know, like... You, I, I sort of think of the example of, um, you know, you want the, there's, there's a character sitting on the beach feeling sad and lonely, you know. Now, you can do that in here, because they can show you that they're feeling sad and lonely. Or you could show a big wide shot with the waves washing in this little wee figure, which makes them feel sad and lonely. Or you might use a combination of the two, you know. And... Uh, <laughs> and you just got to go with what feels right for that part of the story at that time for that character. I mean, there's a, there's a shot in Vigil that people often pick out, pick out, which is after quite early in the film. And I haven't got it here, but quite early in the film, she's just seen her dad. The girl's toss has just seen her dad fall from the cliff, and she runs. And she runs and she runs, and there's a shot which is a long lens shot of Toss running down the hill, stumbles a bit in the creek, gets up and runs. And it runs, it's quite a long shot, I don't know, it would run for maybe 30 seconds, maybe slightly longer. And it always intrigues me that that has an incredible, seems to have a strong emotional impact on the audience. But it's a full long shot on a very long lens of an isolated figure running down the hill. But it puts you right with her emotional state. I don't know how it does it, quite. Probably got something to do with the soundtrack as well. You know. And also knowing the situation you've just come from. But it's just the right shot at the right time. You know. And I, I, I've just experienced it watching it with other people and you just feel them sucked into this. And you think, how does that work? It's just a kid running down the hill. You know? but, Can I ask, is that feel obvious at the time when you're shooting or do you, do you try to get a variety of coverage in case you, know, you already know you're going to edit um, No, I, a situation like that, that's, it. that's the shot. I mean, there are other shots in the sequence, but for that part of the story, we didn't even try to shoot something else, no. And it's one of the things I like about, you know, I mostly work on fairly low-budget projects, um, because I work in New Zealand, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, and, and I like the fact that you have to hone your craft. You have to make the decisions on the day because, you know, you, you haven't got the opportunity to shoot it again next week or, or try it something, to, which you do. You know, I mean, I know, say, working with on something like Lord of the Rings, there are opportunities to revisit things. I mean, that happens all the time, you know. And overshooting, what I call overshooting, you know, smotherage, you know. <laughs> shoot, the, <laughs> shoot the shit out of it, you know, and be, it'll be in there somewhere. You know? I actually, I, I, I enjoy the craft of make the decision on the day, you know, um, honing it down. Uh, the, there's a, a story I heard recently from Roger Deakins, who works with the Coen brothers, um, doing 
a session like this, but with, uh, specifically with cinematographers. And he was talking about a sequence, I think it's in Oh Brother, We're Out There, where there's two characters talking at, at the end of a table, but there's a whole lot of other characters, and there's quite a bit of conversation going on. And the director came with a shot list. He needed the close-ups of these two characters, and he needed the wide shot each, well, the wider shot each way, and he needed punches in on various other people in the conversation. And the DOP said, well, actually, we can get this with two shots. And they ended up with one, a track in on this cam character, which, of course, to start with, included all the other characters around, and the other a track in from the other direction. And those two shots cut together told the whole story. So they shot, you know, I don't know how many hours it took them, but it, they saved themselves a lot of work by making that decision on the day <coughs> rather than in the editing room. Right. Well, I know you um, like talking about story with your director. Your yeah, story. yeah. Which point do you talk about coverage? I think it starts, it depends on the director and the project. It, it does start in pre-production, for sure, but it starts with the feel, naturally enough, you know. I mean, I, I, start, I, I imagine most of us do the same. It starts with the script, and then do I want to work with that director? <laughs> and then has the producer got a deal to offer? You know, if I like the script, then um, the conversation continues, generally, you know. Um, mm. And one of the things I've found, perhaps it's been a slight handicap, is I always have feedback on the script. And uh, I've never had a problem with that with Kiwi filmmakers. Um, you know, I, I have an opinion I, and, and I give it, and I find it, I prefer to give it when, straight after I've read the script. Or if I've got questions about it, you know. Like the, I remember saying to Peter, well, the first time I worked with Peter Jackson was on Heavenly Creatures, and I read the script and said, so how are you going to pull this ending off? Because you know right at the beginning of this, in fact you tell the audience at the beginning of the film what's going to happen. So how's that going to work? You've all, the audience knows what's coming, which you don't, wouldn't normally do in a, in a kind of whodunit scenario. <laughs> And we talked about that. And I thought, this joker knows what he's doing with this film. He, he knew already stylistically where it would go towards the end of the film. The, the last day in Heavenly Creatures is, I think, almost entirely handheld, if you look at the film again. It's not overtly handheld, but it's just got that edge to it. Everything's got a slight, you know. And Pete already was on to that when we first talked. <coughs> What I have discovered is when I've had scripts from America, which has happened on occasions, I, once again, I send back notes and never hear from them again. <laughs> <laughs> End of conversation. Who is this upstart? You know? But that's all right. So. Um, visually speaking, uh, post production houses have so much to say about the final look of a film. Especially in Playtime! <laughs> yeah, they, they take over and they start almost telling the, the, <coughs> the, 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 the cameraman or like how they want it shot and, how, and all that sort of stuff. Or how they want it to look. Exactly. Mm. Um, when do you put your foot down and say, if all, I want it to look like this? Mm. To, to a point, like when, mm. when, do you, when, when, is it, mm. when is it still your look? Mm. Um, on, oh. That's an interesting one because I'll divert a little bit because with the digital technology, um, we there's a new role which is the digital wrangler. I call them the data wrangler on set. And they, they can be bringing up different looks. And, and I sort of see that data wrangler. Uh, when I first started working, the first digital feature, I sort of thought, well, you need that person because they're kind of replacing the laboratory. Um, but what this, the film I just did this year, Medicine Woman, 
be dispensed with that role. And I will try to avoid it from here on. I don't know if there's any data wranglers in the room, but you're out of a job with me. <laughs> so we sent the cards to the post-production house, or when we were shooting down at um, Rua Tahuna, we, sent, we, we had a guy who was looking after them, but not on set. He would take the cards back to the editing room, do the download, make sure it was on three hard drives, send one of them out of the, you know, one of those hard drives then leaves the building, so it's somewhere else, you know. Um, so there was a routine, but it wasn't on set based around a monitor. It was off set. And it gets rid of a whole lot of hoo-ha that you... And apparently, um, it's, there's a real danger, I think it's a real danger that the data wrangler in the States that, you know, because it's a new regime, that they're writing rules about it. The data wrangler has become higher up the list in terms of remuneration than the focus puller. Um, and, and, you know, I can see how a, data, a forceful character in that data wrangling role could actually start to be bullying the DOP. So as I say, it's a bit of a sidetrack, but there's a danger of it actually, what you're talking about, happening on set not just after the process, you know. Um, I think you're in, a, you, you know, you're always in a tricky realm from my limited experience in commercials because I haven't done them for a while because um, there's always so many different pulls and pushes, you know. Well, At least... Well in, in the image now, like with read cameras especially with the ethics, you practically get them on a white, like, it's almost like a white page. Yeah. Very, with, obviously there's a lot of information, there's too much information. And they can pull and push everything. Right, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, do you still sit in uh, yeah, yeah, on yeah. the grade? Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. But with a, see, with a, a th I'm sure it's different with a feature film project because yeah. of the long involvement process, you know. It's, it's always going to be more difficult on a shorter <laughs> time frame project yeah. because... Yeah, you, you sort of haven't got enough... They haven't got the same amount of time to firmly establish where you're going. Yeah. Whereas on a drama project, you know, you're sort of doing that, as, as Cathy mentioned earlier on, you're doing that right early on in pre-production. You know, we, yeah, I, I mean, sometimes even to the point of, once I've got a feel of the shape that the director's looking for, because, I mean, it's usually fairly obvious in the script, but a director will be bringing in their own interpretation, which will have subtleties that I won't have picked up from from the script. Or maybe a completely different interpretation from what I took from the script, you know. Which is my next mission, of course, is to get into the director's head, you know, they see it. But I would like... Then, you know, having said that, yes, I'll sit through the grade, but on projects with Gayleen Preston, she does the grade. She's got a really good eye. On, on Medicine Woman, uh, I encourage Dana to come into the grade, because I know she's got a really good eye. I've just worked with her for how, how many weeks, you know. And there's one other advantage too is that hopefully the director's not colour blind, which I am. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, so that, that's a slight disadvantage in the grade. I do rely on my grader quite heavily in terms of getting the skin tones right and such like. Um, Sorry, go on. Uh, Just on that topic, I think too, the, the, the beauty of film is that film is a director's medium. Film is a director's medium, and I wanted to ask you, out from your perspective, having worked across the board and with so many different directors, mm. what, how would you define a good director? Uh, they, they, they're all different. Yeah, I know that. They're all different, so and and I mean, for for me, I suppose, it, it, I like it when, the, it's interesting because there's a conflict here. You know, I like it when, when a director is, is visual and, and feeds me and feeds off me in that way. You know, some directors are more drama-based, you know, more drama-focused, if you like. And so I'm, I'm sort of enhancing the drama in a way or building on the drama with the pictures. But some directors, I mean, they'll all have an input into that area, but some will, will want you to take more control of it. But then having said that, of course, 
you know, I mean, the, the, perhaps one of our strongest visual directors in New Zealand, it's got to be Vincent Ward. And I've always felt the, the work I've done with Vincent, I mean, he gets good work out of me. Doesn't mean he's easy to work with. <laughs> but, um, but of course, there's, so there's a, there's, a, there's a pleasure in the craft, if you like, but there's often an angst in the process, you know what I mean? And that probably goes for, in, in diff, there's always a degree of that, I think, in, in the creative process, you know. There's often a, a, a degree of angst. So how, just, how descriptive do you like them to be, though? Do you like storyboards like the Wazoo, or do you prefer not to I, I Look, uh, Heavenly Creatures <coughs> was fully storyboarded, and I, I know there was one scene that was shot to the storyboard. <laughs> because because it was obvious it was it was the the Juliet's father being sacked as the dean of Canterbury University, and it's an obvious scenario. There's there's four people sitting at one end of the table and one person sitting at the other end of the table. So even in pre-production, we knew how we were going to shoot it. You know, it was going to be boom. It was a an, a standoff. You know, was you know <laughs> six guns at <laughs> dawn. So you know there's his shot on a couple of sizes and there's their shot and, and close up. It, so that was the only scene we shot to storyboards. Um, but if there's... So I had no objection to the storyboards being there, but we didn't work to them. Um, but I, I remember this... Hmm? Yeah, well, good, but, but see, there a lot of Goodbye Pork Pie has a lot of action sequences and you've got to know what you're doing. If you've got multiple cameras and cars flying around the streets, you better know that that camera's going to be there, that camera's going to be there. So that, that, and, and in Heavenly Creatures, for instance, we, there are sequences that we subsequently storyboarded, but I mean, I storyboarded them according to the location that we'd chosen. And I always remember going on to... Um, uh, for, uh, what was the film? Sons for the Return Home. And uh, Paul, the director, had done a full shot list relating to the whole script. We hadn't looked at locations or anything <laughs> at this stage. And I remember the, produc the uh, production manager going, oh, look, we've got a storyboard. Isn't this fabulous? I said, yep, that's great. <laughs> uh, what I meant... What I was feeling was, that's great that the director has thought it through, but I'm not going to look at it. Because I know when we turn up on the day... And Pork Pie is an interesting example, actually, because we did, a, we did a... It's probably the most thoroughly prepped film that I've ever worked on, actually, which was probably just as well, because we had seven weeks to go from one end of the country to the other and shoot a feature film. But um, the scenes we didn't shot list or storyboard are the interiors where you've got to give the actors room to move. You've got to see what they're going to come up with. You're a mug if you've got too much pre... pre you can have a plan but you've got to be prepared to work around that plan or abandon that plan or fall back on it because nobody's come up with a better idea. You know, it's sort of... Uh, but I've always felt that if, if you've got actors playing out a scene in a room, you've got, to, you've got to use their energy, you've got to draw on their talents. And, but you've got three people sitting in a mini, well, you know, one of them's there, and one of them's there, and one of them's there, and so you can choose your camera angles. You know. And actually, even some of the stuff, like pulling up at a petrol station, we'd chosen the location, we knew we'd pull up at the tank, we knew we wanted it. So a lot of it was actually quite carefully planned. And... In fact, towards the end of the shoot, Jeff and I would go through the next day's work and we had shot lists. I haven't got the script with me, but it's riddled with notes. Um, and we'd go through and go, oh. we knew by then that we could get 20 shots in a day, which is actually quite a busy day shooting 20 shots on the drama. <laughs> um, but we figured, on average, we could shoot 20 shots a day. So we would go through our shot list and eliminate the ones that... Because often you look at your shot list and think, well, actually, that shot and that shot are the same shots that they, can, they combine. It's got rid of one, and you know. 
And yeah, we, 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 it was our nightly, towards the end of the shoot, it was our nightly task was to go through and make sure that we only had 20 shots to do in a day, no more. Because, yeah. I, 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 I reckon on average, a feature film, I mean, tw really 12 to 15 shots a day. I mean, you can pump through more than that, but if you're doing, if you want it to be styly, you can get about 12. 15 at a push, you know. Sorry, yeah? Um, yeah. I had the privilege uh, a few years back to read the mm. and the shoot, and it was really interesting because what she saw through the lens with the DOP was a presence that wasn't in the script, mm. wasn't in the story, but actually motivated the shot. Mm. And I just wonder what, where you find the room to find that presence. Mm. It's, it's sort of something that's coming from in front of the camera is what you're talking yeah. about yeah. and it's something you, f you feel it <coughs> um, I, I remember very clearly a scene on, on Beyond Reasonable Doubt where they brought Len, the, the cops had brought Len, De Len Demler who was a suspect down to the river because they'd found a body and he was the suspect, and they thought they'd bring him down, show him the body, and he'll crack. Lem Demler was paid by Martin Sanderson. The cops were being played by, I can't remember the English actor's name. Um, David Hemmings. Thank you. <laughs> um, um, and Johnny Bates was one of them. Marshall Napier was one of them. And we had the scene to shoot where they, these characters come together. You And I, I talk about... Uh, just as a mechanical thing, when you get a group of people together, there's two ways you can shoot it. You can shoot it from inside the circle, which is quite complicated for eye lines, actually, or you can shoot it from outside the circle, which kind of simplifies the eye lines because you're choosing a, an angle to shoot from. We could not have shot from inside that circle. You couldn't put your hand in it. Your hand, it was, it was hot, <laughs> you know. And, and I just remember the sensation of these actors coming together, and it was scary. And I also remember s insisting that we needed a wide shot. And everyone's going, why, why do we need a wide shot? And I go, I don't know, but we need to just sit back and look at this and feel the river and see the body. And it was almost because of the heat that was being generated between these actors, you kind of needed to just have an overview. And I know the shot was used, so it must have been a right choice. But, um, yeah, you just feel that sometimes. I, that, I, I, I mention that example of it because it was the strongest I've ever felt it. You know, I mean, I'm often emotionally affected by what's going on in front of the camera, which I think is a good thing. You know, I, I, I don't know, but I think it's good if you're sucked into the story when you're supposed to be working on it, you know. <laughs> I, mean, it's a, it, it's, I think it's quite special, you know. You feel a bit of a dick because you, you can't see through the lens properly because you're crying, but, you know. <laughs> but I think, well, you know, if it's working like that, then it, it's working, you know. And if I may say so, most of us actors will look to our dog because you've got the front row seat. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Even before the yeah. you had that front row seat. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm always a wee bit unsure of how much to give out in that regard, you know, because you know that... Just a little eyebrow of the way. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I, 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 I don't think you can hide it, really, from behind the camera, you know, when you pull your eye away from the eyepiece, you know, <laughs> if it's working on you, then... It's yeah, sometimes the director's so consumed with everything else, and they will look to their dogs yeah. to get them yeah. on. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, talking about commercials, I've, I've found myself in the situation where I'm actually deliberately going up to the actors after a take because everyone else has gone to have around a bloody video monitor. And you can feel the actor like, <coughs> yeah. <laughs> what did I do? You know, was, was it, and everyone's having this conversation around a video monitor. And, uh, I, uh, yeah, I've often, well, on occasions I've found myself just going up and, I mean, Standing beside them, so that at least they feel like they're not alone. Now, Bob, can I ask you about the story I've heard about you, but I've never heard you tell it? And that is about a Bolex camera and you filming the 
President of the United States? Oh, it wasn't a Bolix, it was a Bell and Howell. It was a Bell and Howell. I was a young chap when um, it was Ford, wasn't it? Gerald Ford. Was it Johnson? Oh, no, it was Lyndon Johnson who came out here. Yeah, big pardon. It was Lyndon Johnson. So it would have been 1967. And I was shooting on a, a fabulous little camera, actually. It's a, it was a 16mm Bell and Howell, so it wasn't a Bolex, and, and there's a six, key difference actually was that a key difference. <laughs> um, it took a take 100 foot load of 16mm, which is basically two and a half minutes of, of film at 25 frames a second, which is what we shot for television. It has three lenses on the front, a little lens turret, and it has a matching lens turret with little wee lenses for the viewfinder, so you're looking through matching viewfinder lenses and you turn over the lenses and the viewfinder lenses <laughs> turn over too. But the the best thing about the Bell and Howell as opposed to Bolex is you know how Bolex winds like that? Well the Bell and Howell has a key and it winds like like that. So you can actually run with it while you're winding it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a really solid little camera. It's small, you know, I could I could go into a shoot with a can of film, two cans of film in my back pocket, though they never liked you to shoot more than one can of film on a on a news item, but you could have a couple of hundred foot loads in your back pocket, one in the camera, and it's and you could pretend you had nothing, or, or shooting um, shooting at the airport in Wellington, there was a huge press gang of a lot of you know old hands, and they just take up their space you know, <laughs> and not let you in. But this little camera was really good for bumping elbows. Or <laughs> 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 When they start getting too stroppy, you just introduce the camera to them. <laughs> but the other thing I managed to do there was, you know, when, when he was getting off the plane, these heavyweights all just took up the space, you know. So I just crawled between their legs and popped up in front. <laughs> <laughs> and I had really intimate shots of him shaking hands because I was right in the front, crawling along the ground underneath him. In fact, I think he even looks at the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Were you worried about American security? No. They, look, he was shaking hands at the airport with people, you know, things were different then. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the same bloody paranoia that we live with these days. Yeah, it was, he was, yeah. But yeah, that that's, was just, I, I shot a lot of news on that little Bell and Howell and actually a, a mate of mine has, has given me one. He, had found somewhere. It's not fully intact, unfortunately, but it is functional, just as a memento. Yeah. Don't think I'll be putting any film through it anytime soon. Would you be able to tell people who don't like directors? <laughs> 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 um, I don't think a director should have a loud halo. <laughs> <laughs> I think if, if, if a loud hailer is needed, it should be the first assistant who has the loud hailer. Um, we had some issues about that on issues on River Queen. <laughs> 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 there was one day when the loud hailer found its way into the river, actually. <laughs> 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 No, well, there was, there was another day when, when Vincent did, actually, because he, he, I, I had, we'd had words about this, you know, and he put the loud hailer on as we got onto a raft to go on the river and sort of strapped it on and looked at me and I said, don't think that'll stop it going in the river. <laughs> <laughs> but he was, he was very good that day. He only used it to call action and cut, which was fair enough because we were out on the river, you know. But, yeah... Um, uh, I things that I can't off the top of my head. Well, I have thought of one, so there you go. Um, you know, it's nice if you. A lot of the process of working on set is about how you. Well, it's all about communication. It often strikes me that you know we work in a communication business, but the and the. The key to it is how well we communicate amongst our, ourselves and each other. And 
so I guess keeping that communication alive, I feel, is a vital thing. I mean, I'm, I, you know, I've heard stories from directors who started in the, at the National Film Unit, say, years, many years ago. And if they couldn't say which lens they'd want, they'd get scoffed at. And you go, come on, you know, that's sort of part of our job. Is it, it, it's interpretation. And it, it really is, eh? It's, it's, it, you know, like some directors will be very technical and go, you know, I think we should be shooting this on a wide lens, then close down. But other directors will go, oh, I want it to feel moody. I want it to feel sad. I want it to feel, you know, I mean... Actually, Fiona, you and I, I remember having a... I often think of the time when, when um, in that short film... Song of the Silence. Song of the Silence. And, and, and the character was going up into the attic to check out her mother's thing. Yeah. And I argued that the shot of the, her... She, she was getting the stuff out of the attic and there was yeah. we had a shot down the hall with just clothes Close dropping shot. down. Yeah. Yes. We might have even shot it slightly slow motion. We shoot it slow. Yeah. And I remember arguing that that had the same emotional impact as being in there on the actor. Because you've got uh, the thing I try to. Tr you know what? You were right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and it's a funny. And I, I do rely on what feels what it feels like, you know. Yeah. And the other thing, though, that I'm very aware of, especially in something like that where you're centred on one character, is you don't have to be in there all the time. You don't want to be up there all no, the time. No. That's a really good thing to you need The audience needs breathing space as well as the performer and, or the character, in a way, you know. Because mm -hmm. it, 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 it's a way of... Yeah, it's just a way of building a, a perspective around that character. Yeah, and so it does work, eh, that shit? I've always thought that was my idea. <laughs> <laughs> it probably was. I was probably, just, I, I was probably just trying to get out of having to climb up into the attic, you know, and shoot close-ups. But it's really beautiful. Yeah, and yeah. every time I see that little film, it gives me pleasure. So yeah, yeah, it's cool. yours, I think. But, but then there's another thing that I felt we got wrong in that film, which, yes. which is when she looks out the backyard, and actually Catherine brought this up. Through the window. Oh, no, she goes outside oh, once. Oh, I know what you mean, the trousers are on the line. And we didn't shoot a version where we were focused on the background. We only ever focused on her. And I remember discussing it. Mean. I remember discussing it in the day and thinking, well, we want her to feel trapped. Yeah. But actually, uh, Catherine... Uh, um, brought up at one stage, she said, but actually you wanted to feel that distance because she was trapped, <laughs> you know? Isn't that interesting? Because the thing I've always liked most about that shot is the pyjama trousers on the wall. Oh, okay, so, yeah. So actually they are the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, no, yeah. It's, it's but I, it, when it was brought up, I thought, why didn't we shoot it? At least shoot two versions and then you well, do have the, the choice in editing, you know. Exactly, shoot two, two, yeah. two that's, versions. That's the yeah. lesson too. I think when you were inexperienced, like yeah. I was, you know, it was yeah. my second short film and right. like Simon, I was in awe of you, even if I was pretending <laughs> that I wasn't. Um, and you, you think you need to know. Yeah, and yeah. And the more you learn, the more you realise yeah. that you should never pretend yeah, that yeah, you know yeah, yeah. if you right. don't. And yeah, if you've got the time, um, do it the other way, take the good off. But yeah, yeah. You know, you, you really yeah. learn those things. Yeah. It, it seems to take a long time to learn that, though, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, those are always the worst lessons, yeah, yeah. too, the ones that you realise you actually learned two films ago, and why am I learning it again? <laughs> <laughs> why did I, I made that mistake before, you know, because we do, we all make mistakes, of course. Yeah. With, with the, so, sorry, with the, um, to follow on to the question at the back, really. With new digital workflow, is there more and more of a pressure uh, from the director to the, the insidious temptation to fix it in post, to move on? The understanding pressure, and does the DOP mm. come under attention there to, mm. to hold the line on what the original vision was supposed to be, or the field, overall field? Mm. Um, yeah, it's it's a <laughs> the old fix it in post. It's a, it's a dangerous mm. one, eh? It is a dangerous one. Um, you should be getting it right on the night, if you possibly can. Um, but having said that, I, like I will al always argue, particularly on low-budget films, I will always argue for a pickup shoot. 
a day or two of contingency for pickups. Now, it's usually possible. Uh, producers will always say there isn't room for it, but often <coughs> we do it anyway. <laughs> so some somewhere the money is found to, to do it. Um, so in a way, I would argue that against the fix it and post mentality, but if you allow for a pickup shoot, I think that's the, one of the most valuable things you can have. Oh, I'm talking drama in particular, of course. Um, because it allows for two things. One is it allows for the edit to go through and you might spot something that just needs a little... There's one in that sequence we just watched <coughs> of um, Matariki. There's a shot of their feet running upstairs that goes between the container and leads to the bridge sequence. That was shot as a pickup. It's a, it's a tracking shot. It's quite a tricky little tracking shot. You don't feel it, but it gives this thing a real energy, you know, that running upstairs. Um, that was a pickup. But it's also, it, what it allows is that if you've got, you know, a tricky close-up of the clock to get beside the bed, you don't want to be doing that when you've got 25 or 50 people in a film crew hanging around. It's much better to just put it aside and shoot it as a pickup. So that's a slightly different approach to the... But, yeah, the, the old fix it and post does come up, <laughs> inevitably, usually as a joke, actually, but, <laughs> but it does come up quite often. My first production it? supervisor on the last thing I did came to set wearing a T-shirt that said, fix it yourself and not. <laughs> 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 well, that was quite a tricky project, though, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of post-production work involved in that. And it worked well, too, actually, I thought, yeah. You fixed quite a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that was always going to happen. In it, with a pro I mean, it's the nature of the project, isn't it? This, um, remind me of the title? Shackleton's Captain. Shattle Shackleton's Captain, which I'm sure many of you saw. But you, as you, you, you know that they didn't actually go to Antarctica. Well, I presume you didn't go to Antarctica. <laughs> you didn't need Henderson. Yeah, right. <laughs> But you've got to create that mood. Can I just ask something? You showed one sequence. Yeah. Running out of time. Is there another little thing you'd like to quickly show us? Because I feel a bit cheated. Yeah, yeah, right. No, 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 no. no. There's a lovely sequence out of getting square. Oh, no, let's have a look at the piece from Boy. Because I, I, there's a little piece from Boy, which it's only one illustration of many wonderful sequences in Boy. It's interesting. I've heard... I've heard uh, Occasional criticisms of that film, which I think most of us, I, I don't know, as a Kiwi, I, I, I'm really proud of it. I had nothing to do with making it, but I'm really proud of it. I think the only criticism that I felt was perhaps relevant was a woman was obviously quite upset about the kids being left on their Pat Malone, you know, the kids being left alone in the house. That she, she was saying, well, why, why, why didn't the auntie come and look after them? I said, well, she had too many jobs. She couldn't do it. <laughs> but I, I thought, oh, okay, yeah, but... Yeah, back in those days, it is something that wouldn't have happened. It's yeah. probably more believable in this day and age, but back in those yeah. days in rural environments, having grown up... In and in a way, way, I sort of wonder, well, perhaps we didn't... Yeah, but because the kids were preparing their own tucker. And, uh, yeah, so, so, I mean, I thought that was... You know, that, that, the person who made that comment was obviously disturbed by it. Well, I heard but a lot, and maybe that was a pickup. Mm. Maybe there could have been a phone call or something or other, but mm. it was another complication that may have or, or somebody else who was going to bring dinner around yeah. but got waylaid, or yeah, yes, something yeah. like that, and the kids had to eat crayfish again. <laughs> Poor little blighters. <laughs> 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 but yeah, yeah, there might have been a drop. But the other criticism I've heard, I mean, I've heard criticism. <laughs> Of the, of, it was actually a reviewer who criticised Tyker's performance, and I thought, because, because it, it, you know he's like a caricature, but it's the kid's point of view, for yeah. goodness' sake. Well, I think too that Tyker said this publicly is Cliff was always destined to play that role, right? And then at the last minute, Cliff is on the series, and there is a huge, if I may say so, very big difference between the kind of actor Cliff is yeah. and the kind of performer yeah. Cliff is. It's, yeah. It comes down to that question. But, but, but I, th I, th I still think that it has, the style of the performance works because it's the boy's yeah. point of view yeah. of his yeah. yeah. 
you know, and, and that's why I picked this scene because it illustrates that very clearly. Um, yeah, but I was intrigued that a reviewer kind of missed that point. That, that it's actually, you're in the boy's, that's what I think the film does perfectly. It puts you right inside that boy's head. In a way, he is the only one, he's the only straight character in the movie, really. Even his little brother, it's seen from his point of view, you know. And I think, uh, for me, that's, <coughs> that's, that's real cinema, you know, when you are with that character all the way, you know. Anyway. Look at that. Oh, and then the romantic music over there. Do we keep it? It's you know just from that that little bit of blue light coming on the boy as his face lightens up and his imagination takes over. You know, simple stuff, but it puts you, you know. That's why I say it's the, uh, I always feel the mission is to get inside the character's head. And I think that film does it beautifully. Yeah. Um, we've yeah. probably got to start wrapping it up now, but perhaps yeah. is there one more question? Perhaps before we go. Yeah. Helen? Yeah. For both of you, as members of the New Zealand Cinematographer Society, um, have you got any project whereby you guys could design the camera of your dreams, you know, yeah. rather than be subjected to the models that come out? <laughs> um, well, one that fits the human form would be a good start. Yeah. I've, I've argued, I've actually argued, I've, I've, I've even gone to, um, yeah, I've gone to, I tried with Sony. I mean, I, I imagine quite a lot of you have used what they call, what are they called, ENG, you know, electronic news gathering yeah. cameras. And those, you know, the classic model, it's, the body's about that shape. It's got a hollow underneath so you can plonk it on your shoulder. It's got a lens with servos on it for driving the zoom and the, you know, the various... And it has a hand grip on the lens. I would have thought that was rule one. You don't pick a camera up by the lens. And here's a camera designed with a hand grip on the lens. So it's first problem, you shouldn't be taking the weight of the camera on the lens. Second problem is you now can't hold that camera because the whole weight of the camera is behind it, so it has to sit on your shoulder. I can't work with that, and I've had to, you know, so I'm holding onto this handle or I'm holding it like this. Or It's a badly designed tool, and there's millions of them all over the world. And I've, said, I've, I've tried talking to the... the, the I got a bit of an ear from Panasonic, but I actually think we're growing away from that era that style of camera now anyway. But it just boggled me that there were so many of these pieces of shit on the market. And the buttons are all in the wrong... You know, you've got a button on this hand grip, which you can't use because it's not in the right place. <laughs> well, I couldn't use it because I don't want the camera locked to my shoulder. I, if I'm hand-holding, I want to be free to move. I don't mind having it on my shoulder if I'm trying to hold still, but if I'm moving, I, it's going to be off my shoulder. And... But, um, so the hand grip should be a point of balance. The old film cameras, they used to put the hand grip at point of balance on the camera so you could hold it in one hand, you know. And of course the small ones, they're light enough to do it. But the other thing, yeah, so those cameras, they'd have a button on that hand grip, which I'm not using, and where's the other button? It was somewhere around here under the lens, if you can find it. <laughs> Just infuriating piece of... That, um, and I remember... such. Eh? But great draw stops. Eventually. <laughs> <laughs> I remember saying to and they, so somebody saying to me, oh, surely, you know, there's literally millions of them in the world. Surely they haven't got it wrong. And I thought, well, do you remember when you first got a VCR and nobody could work them? Because, <laughs> you know, like, they don't always get it right, even though they make millions of them, you know. I mean, we haven't got motor cars right yet, so. <laughs> All right, well. Oh, sorry, well. Um, I was just wondering uh, what other films and uh, media and artists do you draw inspiration from visually? Oh, um, Michael Lunick, um, Spike Milligan. <laughs> I like the mad geniuses of this world who, who I, I think that, yeah. Um, so I, I don't really have, in terms of my favourite 
sort of films, I tend to go for the animated kids' films. Like I've got a clip from Monsters, Inc. here, which we didn't look at. But, um, so I, I guess I, I'm inspired by, if it's by other people, it's other people with a perverse view of the way we live on this planet, you know. Because I do think it's something we need to look at quite carefully, actually. And, and it's those other points of view that often bring clarity to the, the common perception, you know, that, that's any use to you. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, Apple. Um, Cheers. <laughs>